Yeah, so, dear colleagues, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, all of us are somehow concerned with the brain. And we would like to understand what is the nature of the brain, of this incredible organ, which is so complex, and where we see so many details that we do not yet understand. And this is such a fundamental question, similar to the question of what is the nature of the universe. And when we are asking as scientists such fundamental questions, sometimes we find out that there are amazing similarities. For example, here on the right-hand side, so you see the human hippocampus. But on the left-hand side, this is a spiral galaxy. And we may ask, of course, the question, is this only the appearance that is very similar? Or are there also rules behind that lead to the development of a certain structure? Are they also similar? It's a speculation. But interestingly, this spiral galaxy comes from the Pegasus, and it was discovered by Edouard Jean-Marie Stéphane. He was the director of the observatory in Marseille, and the spiral galaxy is also part of the Stéphane's quintet. So I think Marseille is really the right place to have a science meeting like this. And to ask the question about brain complexity leads us to numbers that are very impressive. So we know that there are 86 to 100 billion nerve cells with up to 3 million kilometers of fibers connecting them. That means 2 to the power of 10 to the power of 15 different brain states are possible, theoretically. And how can we approach such most complex system. The Human Brain Project started as a flagship project in 2013 and brought together a network of more than 500 researchers from 155 institutions in 19 countries. And the Human Brain Project made sure that these researchers are being connected. But in order to address the multi-level complexity in space and in time, we need a network of different disciplines. And while each discipline has its own approach to target the cellular organization or the molecular or the genetic organization, this leads also to a certain fragmentation. And we had to overcome um, this fragmentation in neuroscience. And at the right time point, I would say, the development of neuroscience on the one hand, but also on digital technologies and computational technologies on the other hand, lead to a situation where these things can be connected. And we as researchers had to learn how to communicate with each other, but also how to communicate um, based on a platform, and this needs us, leads us to networks of computing. During the past years, we have observed that artificial neuronal networks became more and more powerful, and we have applied them to solve our problems, but also gave inspiration and insights from brain research to the development of new networks. We have two most powerful simulation uh, neuromorphic systems, brain scales and Spinnaker. Um, and we have also a platform of high-performance supercomputing centers that is preparing towards exascale to address the large-scale data analysis, modeling, and simulation jobs that we are doing. And this is done and supported by the Phoenix infrastructure. And this infrastructure is a base infrastructure for eBrains. That is our research infrastructure for neuroscience for brain research, and it offers different uh, types of tools and services, web-based access. It allows to build your own workforce and to speed up your tools of research, to simulate large networks, explore data in the atlas, and also share data with others. So this infrastructure means that it hosts also a network of methods and 
these are necessary to explore the different spatial and temporal scales. And methods are again coming from different uh, fields, starting with optical techniques, with molecular um, technologies, with brain mapping in the living or in post-mortem human brain, with cell recordings, or also with functional imaging to image the living human brain. And um, with EEG and MEG, we can capture the dynamics of brain organization. We are using modeling and simulation, applying neurotechnology, and um, all this is, so to say, under the framework of the, uh, the e-brains. And with this approach, the HPP aims to gain deeper insights into brain organization and of course to understand brain function and dysfunction and how is this related to brain structure. We want to develop new diagnostics and therapies in the project and to co-design neuroderived technology, but also provide input and design new artificial neuronal networks. We want to shape future computing towards exascale and we want to build an international community of researchers, which is a prerequisite, mandatory. That means also to advance the framework of ethics um, for neuroscience at the end for the benefit of the society. So this is what we formulated as our goals at the beginning of the project. And now, after having uh, a period of 10 years, Let's have a look what, what has been achieved. And I'm jumping to the next. No, that's not the right direction. I'm sorry. <laughs> Nein. I'm trying to move on. Good. Now, what has been achieved? Technology is a challenging thing, I can tell you. So let me give only a few examples. Um, more is not possible in this talk. But this is a nice example also of collaboration between our friends uh, in France uh, at Neurospin, um, our friends at Amsterdam University, and my own team at Jülich. And we have imaged a post-mortem human brain with ultra high resolution in an MR scanner. We have then cut the brain, imaged the fibers using polarized light imaging, and have uh, a triple staining that in one and the same section reveals not only the fibers, but also different cell types. And on the lower left, you see a block phase reconstruction where the vessels are being detected. And this is really unique. We had never a possibility to have such a detailed and high resolution reconstruction of vessels before. Simulation is in the focus of our activities from the very beginning. But what is really new and has now been only achieved is that we can combine the different approaches of simulation. And we have of one, on one hand, we have data-driven approaches on the other hand, we have task-driven approaches. We can model and simulate small neurons with very high accuracy, with a lot of biological details, and small microcircuits in order to develop detailed microcircuit models and simulate them. But we can also go to the level of the whole brain and have developed neural mass models and uh, connectome models they are part of the virtual brain models, the TVB, um, that, that is uh, an important simulation engine at the macro scale. And we have task-driven models uh, of behavior, functional models for control, and here we focus in particular on sensory motor and cognitive models. And the advantage is, a big step is in my view, that now these different approaches, modeling and simulation approaches, they come together. And independence, what the precise research question is or clinical application question is, we can focus on one simulation engine, but this model can be then also informed by, um, by results of simulation coming from other simulation engine. 
And this ecosystem is part of the e-brains infrastructure. We have seen a lot of progress in studies on brain plasticity, learning, adaption during the whole lifespan. And this is an example from Peter Rolfsemar's lab where he has uh, provided uh, a discussion and concepts about the way how the different microcircuits are being connected in the human cerebral cortex. And he distinguished the different flows of information, feed forward, feed back. And he also emphasizes that neuromodulation um, introduced by neurotransmitters like acetylcholine, dopamine, and others is key, of course, uh, to get the deeper understanding of the circuits in the brain. And um, these neurotransmitters are extremely important when we think about clinical application, about drug development, but they are also important when we think about brain science. And a few years, years later, after Peter has published his paper, um, we were able also to show receptor autoradiograms of different brain areas, again here for the acetylcholinergic receptor, and showing that the distribution of this receptor is also different between the different layers, and it is also different when you move from primary area to higher areas. So by bringing these insights together, we feel that we have a very good basis to better understand how information is processed in the brain, what happens when this information processing is disrupted, what happens in disease. And to bring these data together means also that they have to be represented in a way that is topographically correct. The brain is a spatial organization also. And the human brain atlas, based on cytoarchitectonic prob uh, probabilistic maps, provides such a framework for representing different types of data, not only structural, but also functional data. And this is an ongoing activity, of course, and we are by far not at the end of filling this atlas with all kinds of data, but I would say without the Human Brain Project, without the technologies that we have developed for, um, for handling the data, that would not be possible. We have also made a lot of progress in one of the most mysterious questions, I would say, what is consciousness? But this has also very practical applications when we think about patients um, that are unconscious. And it is important not only for the doctors, also for the family, for everybody who is caring, um, whether these patients are really unconscious or whether they perceive some information, whether they can hear something, um, also they give not uh, any reaction. And the team by Marcello Massimini and, um, and the, the team in Leuven has developed methods to measure consciousness with the accuracy that is really important and goes into clinical application and helps doctors to decide what's happening with their patients. You heard already that uh, the virtual brain is in the center of a clinical trial that was initiated here in Marseille and that involves 400 patients. And I'm really curious to learn about the outcome. So that would really reach a major breakthrough if based on predictions of uh, individual models, we can have a better outcome in patients with epilepsy. There are also outcomes that are going towards neurotechnology. And uh, this is an example here by Rainer Goebel's lab where we bridge the gap between human and machine intelligence. And what Rainer did was he took uh, networks that are being activated in a scanner in human subjects when they are doing a certain sensory motor task and transferred this knowledge um, as a scheme to an uh, artificial neuronal network, and this network drives a virtual robot uh, to move the cubic as fast and accurately as possible. So I expect that insights from the human brain will become much more important in the next years in AI, in neurotechnology, and in neurobotics. 
And we are very proud that from the very beginning, we have two of the internationally most important neuromorphic devices uh, in the HPP and have supported further development of the system, but also benefited, of course, from the systems. One of it is um, the Spinnaker device um, invented by Steve Ferber and now with Christian Meyer um, in, in Dresden being continued. And this has already resulted in large industry projects and um, in new companies um, that, have been, uh, that have been founded in new startups. And the BrainScale chip is a second uh, large device and you can have a look um, outside at the science market. So all this is supported by eBrains and uh, Jan Bialy will give uh, uh, some more insights. As a human brain project, we are committed to responsible research and innovation. This is mandatory. And I'm very proud that from the very beginning, we had an ethics and philosophy subproject. We were the first in the world that had it. And the discussion between neuroscientists, engineers, philosophers, and ethicists play, of course, an extremely important role also in the future. So the scientific output, in my view, is extremely promise, also it's extremely convincing, it's great. I mean, so many papers, really influential in high level, um, in high level journals. Um, a lot of dissertations, which is equally important be because we want to educate also a next generation. And many of the insights uh, that have been gained inside the project um, were supported uh, by researchers from inside and outside the project. So that's, I think, is really also one of the important results that the project created a network in Europe. And at some point, it does not play any role whether researchers are coming from inside or from outside the project. So what comes next? Well, we have started to discuss the future of neuroscience um, in two years ago, almost two years ago. And then we, we decided that it is not enough to do it within the HPP community, but we had to enlarge to the outer community as well in order to rely on their insights, on their ideas, uh, on their concerns also. So we broadened up the way how we discussed uh, our science paper and uh, have put the first living paper to Zenodo uh, one year ago, and then uh, there was a second version, a third version, and a couple of days ago, we have published a fourth version at Sonodo. And this was a truly inclusive process. Everybody who had a contribution is part of this proposal, uh, of this paper, and also discussed what is the future of digital brain research and we identified eight different areas where this research will probably happen. And for every of these areas, we identified short, middle, and long-term goal. And I would like to invite you to also discuss this paper, to go to the booth where Natalia Fedorchenko is, and she helps you also to include your contributions to be a co-author or also to be a supporter of this paper. And after the summit, we will have a last final version number five. And uh, then, so to say, we think that we have delivered a version, uh, a vision of science uh, that is useful for new scientific projects, for calls to inform policy and uh, to inform others. So please visit us. The future has already started, I would say. And we see it, for example, that we can build now ultra high resolution brain models of the whole human brain. And this is also something that is distinct from the activities that we see in other brain initiatives. And what you can see here, these are high resolution images of single axons, and you can appreciate the complex architecture of these axons, which are crossing and which are forming really, I would say, universe that, that we did not see until now. Yeah, so by developing these optical techniques, we are really able to develop concepts about the 3D architecture of, um, 
of fibers, of axons. And if you have a look to this pixel, this is 1.8 micrometer. And now we decrease the resolution to show you what is happening when you have not such a high resolution. And this is 1,000 micrometer. This is one of the best resolutions you can get with in vivo MRI. And this illustrates that it is really necessary to have this multi-scale approach. Yeah, you cannot get this insights from a living human brain. The poor subject would live two, two weeks probably in the scanner. That's not feasible. So we have to bring in the data from different experiments and make it accessible so that everybody can use it. We have developed already now the first digital twins of the brain and body. And uh, in Lausanne, uh, an exciting project has started that is now being continued in, in Erlang and in Düsseldorf with personalized 3D models of the spine based on biophysics, based on imaging data and physiological data and a, a theory behind. And this has already helped uh, patients after a complete lesion of the spine to walk again. And it is so important when we think about chronic pain patients, for example. And at the end, we would also like to combine the brain models with the spine model, yeah? because the brain is not acting by itself. The brain is part of a body. And uh, to develop such big twin, mo uh, twin models is, uh, of course, a project of future research. Also future research is, and also has already started, to develop new drugs. Drug development is extremely extensive. Uh, about 10 years, but if we could exclude through simulation at the beginning those drugs which will not work efficiently, then we can of course shorten this period significantly. And what we are doing in the Human Brain Project is connecting the molecular simulation um, at the quantum level, for example, with simulation addressing little circuits to make it biologically more realistic. And one, this is really one also of the big achievements in my view and will uh, be progressing in the next future. We all have observed in the last few weeks, I would say, um, the big noise uh, around ChatGPT. Um, but we have our own ChatGPT that is called Lion. Um, in, the, in our project. And I would like to emphasize first, the, the image that you see is a result of, uh, of AI work based on Lion. But what I also find extremely important is that this is a large scale artificial intelligence open network. And it's at very low cost um, as compared to the huge efforts that uh, the big companies uh, like, like Google and others putting on. And I find it important that such initiatives also in Europe should be supported. We have developed and are being developing uh, codes now that are running on the fastest supercomputers in the world towards exascale. And Arbor is our baby of the HPP. Uh, we are developing um, codes for modular science, multi-scale simulation, learning to learn, and memory-aware SLAM plugins. So when we think about the future of computing, then we are already now using compute resources and we are using different computers and different uh, um, hardware architectures. And um, for, for neuroscience, we do not always need these big and very high scaling uh, booster systems. Sometimes it's okay enough to have a slower going but very memory rich um, uh, cluster system. We can think about, or we have already included neuromorphic systems into our research. And we can think about in the future to have quantum technology because we have optimization problems at many places. But also the other way around, I think we can give input to the development of new computing. The way, for example, we work with computers in an Inter interactive way or neuromorphic computing, which is a direct uh, outcome, I would say, uh, of, this, of this type of brain research. And when we think about the future, then we could also ask the question at the end, 
how much will we have synthetic biological models, uh, modules um, in the next computer. And there have been in the last weeks um, some very interesting papers. And Carl Fristen, again, lead scientist in our project, has published a year ago um, a paper about uh, such a system that is playing Pong. So I would say the future has started. Welcome to the summit. Yes, the future has started and eBrands is continuing. But let's take a look back first. In March 2016, the Human Brain Project, as we heard earlier this morning, released its first six ICT platforms, basically collections of tools and services. Now, they were released under slightly different titles than the ones we have today, but the foundation for what we have today started at that point in time. Very early on, the effort to bring these different platforms together, to create links between them, connect them, uh, started. That resulted in something which was launched and probably uh, described at the Maastricht summit, and it was referred to as the HPP joint platform. And in that joint platform, the elements were more brought together, and also for the first time, we had a user support team, high-level support team, which is a splendid idea. It has been working since then. It has given us a lot of experiences. And now after the HPP with a number of developing teams around Europe, they will definitely continue under different model uh, uh, providing this kind of support. Now that baby had to have a name. The name ended up being eBrains. And eBrains.eu was then launched at the Society for Neuroscience meeting in 2019 with the message that eBrains provides digital tools and services which can be used to address challenges in brain research and brain-inspired technology development, assisting researchers with everything they do, collect, analyze, share, integrate data, perform modeling and simulation. The logic was that everything being developed would be in humanbrainproject.eu work in progress, whereas what was ready to go out to be used by others outside the project would be at the ebrains.eu web portal. Now then, summit in Athens, February 2020. What happened? Well, we first consolidated this position by repeating the messaging, and we also clearly sent the message that this should be a long-lasting effort. The next step was to have eBrains on the European roadmap of infrastructures, and uh, HBP had started to prepare a proposal to the S3 roadmap 2021, which succeeded very well, uh, thanks to the effort of, in 2020 coming in, eBrains, ASBL CEO Pavel Sviboda, and the SIB, Science and Infrastructure Board Chair Katrin Amens, who led this effort towards the successful inclusion of eBrains in this roadmap of the European Strategy Forum on Research Infrastructures. With commitments from nations uh, and the eBrands ASPL being the centre of this, uh, with owners being several institutions, many institutions in Europe, and a number, a very large number of associate members. Today we have these collections, clusters of services. They are delivered by the HPP now as an eBrands research infrastructure, and they will be continued to be delivered now from the nodes, the national nodes, and the partners around Europe, and we'll return a little bit to that later. Now let's look at where did this come from, and did we really meet expectations? And Katrin in her presentation actually went through that, so I can be brief here. So if we look back seven years, we can see exact statements in all the planning documents that led to exactly where we are today on major public data resources, which we have in the data knowledge services, uh, on um, atlases, where we have completely new capabilities in the atlases services, on the in silico experimentation and model validation and modeling workflows, which is included in these uh, services today, 
state-of-the-art neuromorphic devices and state-of-the-art neurobotic setups, which is included in the brain-inspired technology services, and also the key aspects related to facilitating development of personalized treatment, which builds on collecting a lot of health data in very smart solutions for analysis, the medical data analytics services. We also have the same predictions for the uh, computing capacities and for cloud services, which has been implemented uh, through various uh, mechanisms in HPP and in the accompanying Phoenix research infrastructure, serving as a base infrastructure. Now, the eBrains tools and services actually all together makes it possible to do research at all levels, multi-scale, multimodal from lower left gene molecular level to the uh, cells, the networks, the brain regions, the whole brain. The tools and services may perhaps tend to be a little bit more on the upper right side, but the modeling goes all the way through all these levels. I would like to emphasize that these tools and services really stand on the shoulders also of the ethics and society efforts in HPP, which has been world leading and plays a tremendous role in, in really analyzing what you're doing here. So, the tools and services are suitable for multi-scale multimodal analysis, but they are developed in the context of scientific questions and training of researchers, and they're often combined. And these are very strong arguments for having a real research infrastructure and not only scattered tools here or there. So instead of going through the services one by one, I will take a starting point in a few very concrete examples and then see what kind of comments we can give to the tools and services. So here is a drawing uh, received from a friend of mine in the audience. And we have um, a number of tools and services, as you can see on the left. Uh, and we have a number of papers. These papers describe the hippocampus mostly and some other brain regions. And by reading them, you learn about how hippocampus works. But they could not be prepared without tools and services that exist within eBrains. So let's look at the concrete story. Here it is. So on the left side, you see concrete tools and services. Several of them are online tools. At the upper right, you see the eBrains live papers, where you can go from the publications to the right into the live papers, look at the data, and do experiments yourself with the same data. It uses the Phoenix infrastructure lower left. It could have used the neuromorphic computing devices. There would be other comparable examples for that story. It could also use other simulators than Neuron, which was the case here. Uh, it could also use the neurobotics platform. This is the logic of combining tools and services to create new research products. Another example, going out to a broad community, Nest desktop. A tool for the classroom. This is an amazing capacity provided by the Nest community in the context of HPP. It, is, uh, it means that people can go in and learn how this advanced simulator works without having uh, programming skills. It's a bridge to the community for starting doing modeling simulation. This image you see earlier today, here serving as one of two complete, concrete clinical applications. So here we have a brain to the left, which where you can see a number of electrodes inserted. It's the brain of a patient being prepared, preparing for epilepsy surgery. If the neurosurgeon only had the recordings from these different sites in that brain, it would help him or her to do the right optimal surgery to remove the epileptic focus. But if those data are inserted into a model of the brain where you can take other valuable information elements and combine them, the result is much better. You essentially create a digital twin to the right, and that informs the surgeons much better how to move on with the surgery to have the best possible result. I'd like to emphasize also with this example that data from these patients are now being collected across Europe from many hospitals in the intracranial EEG database, inter intracranial recording database. I even got calls from hospitals next to myself in Oslo asking, so this is really happening now, we're going to contribute. Optimization of deep brain stimulation is another uh, uh, example in the same domain, uh, with models being shared on eBrains, with data being brought into uh, services for sensitive data so that they can be used by many, 
and uh, with concrete uh, results on the clinical side, for example, uh, for the planning of the brain stimulation yeah, for Parkinson patients, for example. Then we have the famous atlas, and I just wanted to uh, highlight at this point the fact that this is really multi-dimensional, multi multi-level. And this, in this recent article, uh, you can find a summary which really points to how this multi-level approach, combining information at multiple levels, is important for decoding mechanisms and also can do that for uh, brain function in not only health but also disease. And again, the tools around it are critical. So on the eBrands platform, you have not only the Atlas, but also tools to use and navigate uh, the Atlas uh, together uh, with other data. And here's an example uh, on how we can study genetic architecture of resilience to a particular disease, in this case, Alzheimer's disease, using eBrains tools. So the example is that many patients, or actually people who may not be patients, have the same pathological changes as Alzheimer's disease patients, but they are not sick. They have resilience to the disease, and this is related apparently to genetic factors. And to analyze that, you can go into rich animal models and really map the whole brain for these genes. This is done now in collaboration with the Jackson Laboratory in the US, using eBrains tools, put into workflows. All the workflows are carefully documented, They're even used by a number of researchers elsewhere who we have never heard about, but we find their publications and they use the tools. So this is an example of how you can uh, create tools that are very well documented, connect them, create workflows, also, we will be storing these workflows and, and sharing them through the eBrands platform itself. To bring all this together, we have this unifying system, the knowledge graph. Maintained by the eBrands AISBL team, it's a magnificent resource. It is basically a, a very flexible metadata management system that allows you to connect all kinds of information. Of course, primarily all the data sets. People are also uh, in a position to submit data sets, to have them included here, together with models and software. And then you can go and search for this directly in the graphical user interface or with an API. Uh, this is an example of a service continuing uh, with several nodes uh, collaborating so that the service will continue to be able to receive data and the storage is secured for many years ahead of us. So eBrands is, is continuing in, in this way in, in the future. A couple of reminders of the importance of this effort. eBrains is a driver of science because tools and data, very strong evidence, it influences what we are actually doing. The more data we have access to, the more tools that we have access to, the more IDs we get and the more doors we open. We also contribute to the open science trend, removing barriers for sharing output by providing solutions that work, that allows you to share, to get credit, to be cited, to have citable DOIs, for example, for data and tools. And this is important for addressing the reproducibility and repl replicability crisis, the fact that it is actually very difficult in many scientific disciplines to repeat the research. That is not very scientifically interesting. So something has to happen there, and it is happening, and eBrands is moving this very much forwards. There is no other way, and eBrands is in the lead in this regard. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jan. Thank you very much. Our third speaker, in this session is Deputy Director General Thomas Cordas. He is Deputy Director General at DG Connect of the European Commission and has been involved in the Human Brain Project for many, many years. It is a pleasure to have you here, Thomas. Thank you, Victor. You can hear me well. And uh, so, Victor, Kathleen, Jan, uh, dear HPP, uh, uh, researchers here, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, a, a real pleasure for me to take uh, the floor at today's HPP summit. Of course, I would have liked to be together with you there, but the recent events make it almost impossible for me 
for me uh, to, uh, to be physically there. But I can tell you already that I'm morally, ethically, whatever else you can say, uh, with all my brain with you and uh, fully supporting from a DigiConnect perspective and from a European Commission perspective, the Human Brain Project and its present and next steps. So this year we are celebrating the 10 years of the HPP flagship and uh, uh, looking back somehow on the decades worth of intensive and challenging work. I think that what we have seen in all this cruising, um, I would say, uh, uh, period that we had so far was uh, how important was the human brain, the support of the human brain, and how much it has led from what we heard today, but also over the years, about the, and how inspiring and fascinating was the whole journey. I think from the very beginning, the whole story was extremely visionary, uh, aiming at to broaden the boundaries of neuroscience and transform the way to study the brain. Some of you may remember in the early days of the Human Brain Project that you faced, we faced some controversy. It doesn't matter after all. And uh, I think that the project has shown, the scientists have shown, that uh, we have managed to redefine the uh, flagship objectives and uh, we have managed to set out even more realistic goals that were still highly ambitious. This was only possible, I must confess, by, uh, thanks to the very, very high involvement of inspirational, talented, and forward-thinking people like you are. I would here like to start from Professor Katrin Amunds, who coordinates the Human Brain Project with great dedication and uh, who uh, is promoting forward the research that is needed to deliver the HBP objectives. I would also like to acknowledge the work, of course, of the whole science and infrastructure board members for all their inspirational contributions and the very, very high level of scientific hearing that we have provided over all these years. I would not like to forget also that we have managed to train, actually, and to initiate to the project a total new generation of young researchers who have started contributing to these projects. The figures are there and they witness exactly the fact that human brain is having and is going to have an impactful, I would say, uh, um, uh, an impactful um, progress and impact out there for science and technology development. All these new people have helped develop an innovative approach to neuroscience and to ensure that this is widely spread in the universities, in scientific institutions, not least, of course, and not, not least thanks, of course, to the connections that they have established between the member states that, has, that uh, HPP has really helped to forge here. So altogether, your excellence has and continues to show uh, how big ideas uh, can trace the path to big scientific discoveries, contributing to what science will be in the future for the generations to come. This comes with high risk, of course, but at the same time, yes, it can bring enormous rewards and very high impact if all this is successful. Next slide, please. Now, let me take a few minutes to uh, uh, have also some insight to uh, the big achievements uh, of HPP uh, since uh, uh, this, I mean, uh, uh, I think the session is about that today and show you uh, exactly the impact of HVP, but also the way forward. I think with HVP, the brain research has really entered a new epoch. It's very clear from what has been presented just before me by Katrin, by Young, but I think that what the big difference is here is that we have shown, you have shown, how large-scale multidisciplinary collaboration and digital technologies are contributing to transforming completely the way brain research is carried out. When we started 10 years ago, and we were talking about big data, about data analytics, about new forms of AI, about neural morphic computing, about uh, using simulation, extensive simulation, uh, and modeling using supercomputing facilities, all these were somehow uh, totally new, especially in the scientific fields you are dealing with. But these have really become the innovative tools that are helping you to better understand the brain diseases. So all along the way, biological processes and structures have inspired new forms of ICT. And I think that HBP has really been a driver in both these directions, understanding the brain, but also inspiring new forms of ICT. 
The evolution of uh, the HPP testifies to the breadth of this transformation. When the project started, hardly no one believed in the potential of big data, in the potential of uh, supercomputing, and the possibility of using all those to simulate uh, the complicated functions of the brain, or to verify and develop the latest neuroscientific theories. I think today, by contrast, you are building the first digital twin of the human brain. Not only that, but you are also employing the most advanced digital methods from high performance computing, soon at a scale computing, supercomputing, and soon also quantum computing, uh, and of course, neuromorphic computing to neuroinformatics and to artificial intelligence to carry out brain research, translate your knowledge in novel applications in medicine and in technology. I think Katrin Amunds has already highlighted very well your recent achievements, scientific achievements, and impact that you already have out there. Just a little bit to summarize them, also from my perspective, from the perspective of the European Commission, without going necessarily into the insights, the deep insights that Catherine has provided. I think one of the most impactful things that we have generated is this detailed atlas of the human brain that was ever made. It is covering all aspects of the brain, from structure to function. This has already made its mark on clinical research. I think uh, uh, also Jan Bialy has very much demonstrated the impact of this uh, um, atlas that we have created, but also its connection to the knowledge graph, etc. We have also scaled up computational brain modeling and simulation, representing brain mechanisms from the smallest level to the whole brain. The virtual brain here is an excellent example of how a personalized simulation engine can be used to understand and treat epilepsy. And frankly, we are super interested in seeing how uh, such an engine, how the clinical trials now of such an engine that are funded by the French state uh, would be performing since they are now currently running in 13 hospitals. And if I understand well, they are, uh, would concern more than 400 patients. Now, if we move to another area, we have advanced our understanding of how the brain makes sense of what we see and our knowledge of the neural mechanisms underlying vision as well as memory. In what could be a landmark achievement, we have built a brain implant that could help blind people see by stimulating the visual cortex, cortex of the brains. We have developed new methods to measure and distinguish different states of conscience, consciousness at brain level. We heard also that today, from awake to asleep, to anesthetized, to impaired due to brain injury or diseases, and now clinical trials are starting um, for methods of detecting consciousness, even in newcomer patients. In addition, I think you have shown how uh, the AI, uh, sorry, and uh, how ICT more broadly can be uh, impacted by your studies. So we have now robots with skills derived from those of the brain itself that can navigate, can interact with humans with greater ease. This is not only helping advance the field of robotics, but it's also feeding back into neuroscience, enhancing our understanding of the brain's function. Another major result we have achieved is the capacity to customize and personalize brain models. The predictive power of these models has been gradually increasing. They can prove to be of a major advantage in the discovery of early biomarkers for diseases such as Alzheimer, for which there is no curative intervention at the moment, as we know very, very, very well. And I, I, I left a little bit last, although not the least one, uh, all, all, all these, uh, I mean, I would say, huge work that has also been done around the in-brain research infrastructure. And one thing I can assure you is that despite some changes that may take place in the management of the e-brains, as we heard some uh, of those this morning, the Commission will always be, as it has been in the last 10 years, behind the further development of this infrastructure. And we are... Uh, uh, aim to continue it further developing as an open platform. I think it's an essential infrastructure that has been developed here, as it provides European neuroscientific community with access to data, to digital tools, to models and services, together with the federated high-performance computing, cloud storage, network infrastructure, and soon cloud command, uh, sorry, quantum computing infrastructure that we will make available in the next few years. So for us, this eBrain uh, research infrastructure is, an enabling, is really enabling the collaboration on a very large scale and facilitates the integration of brain science across disciplines and national borders. So it provides not only a new way of sharing data, 
but it allows to share original research data as openly as possible and as restricted or controlled as necessary for data on human subjects. And you know very, very well that is also providing access to medical data that are extracted from pre-processed neuroimaging, neurophysiological and medical records without transferring original clinical data. And I think, again, that this is another good uh, advancement that has been made thanks to the work of the medical platform in the HPP. Now, with the eBrain's research infrastructure and the HPP facility hubs that are distributed across several EU countries, more and more users from academia and industry will be able to collaborate and carry out cutting edge scientific research. And for us, equally important is that eBrain's data and knowledge services are also open to the whole world. And this is really facilitating international collaboration on brain research and not only. So in recognition of all this huge value, eBrains has now become an S3 research infrastructure and is on track to becoming the reference really research infrastructure for all those involved in brain health and in brain research. So we hope it will make it possible to uh, continue the transforming advances that are experienced by New York Science over the last few years, and especially those that are enabled by new ways of working with large data sets. I close this chapter here, and I would like to move to the next uh, slide, where I would like to provide you a little bit the bigger picture, or if you want, the, uh, the vision that uh, we are developing right now in the European Union concerning digital for health and digital uh, uh, with health. So, first of all, as you know very well, data is uh, fundamental to a much broader digital transformation of healthcare that has been starting several years ago, that is currently, currently ongoing, and which it will now, uh, and I would like to take a few minutes, as I said, to explain all this. I think this transformation is marked by tremendous progress that is enabled by the digital revolution that the world is going through right now. And I think that we are very, very well suited in, uh, in Europe uh, to be able to uh, benefit from all this, to capitalize on our strengths and deliver tangible benefits to the patients. Actually, I would say that we are at the nexus of developments in four closely interconnected areas. Science and technology, a regulatory framework that we are putting in place, an increased availability of digital infrastructures, and finally, an enhanced collaboration within and across ecosystems. Let me start by science and technology. In terms of science and technology, I think breakthroughs in areas such as genome sequencing, medical imaging, molecular, molecular modeling, coupled with scientific computing, advanced data architectures, and data acquisition tools are really leading to new discoveries at an increasing rate. We have also shown a lot of those, and many of these discoveries are already of use to clinicians, treating patients, as well as contributing to the emergence of personalized medicine. Let me also focus few uh, uh, two minutes free to the regulatory framework that we are advancing uh, in recognition of uh, the advances that uh, I've just described. So in 2020, we have defined the Data Governance Act, which is now supporting the data sharing across sectors and member states. The Data Governance Act stipulates how value from data can be created and introduces the concept of data altruism which is particularly important in healthcare and in science also. In addition now, we have been promoting the notion of the European Health Data Space Regulation. We proposed that last May, and it's still to be adopted by the co-legislators, that is the Council of the European Parliament, and where our ambition is uh, to have the possibility of health data to be uh, shared widely and safely. This is certainly uh, based uh, in part on the European Health Record Exchange format, which is actively, de actively developed by member states authorities working all together. You know already, and uh, I think uh, Kathleen has already highlighted quite well, how artificial intelligence is playing a major role in the healthcare of the future, for example, in the case of the human brain. And here, we, um, our aim is to enhance trust and regulatory certainty to be able to use uh, artificial intelligence and especially the new kind of artificial intelligence like ChatGPT uh, or uh, Lion or whatever will happen in Europe, hopefully uh, um, within also the next few years. So we have been advancing here in uh, AI Act that we uh, published in April 2021, 
and which is still to be adopted again by the co-legislators. And we do hope that this act will be able to bring together with uh, excellence and trust, protect our fundamental rights, and promote the safe use of AI. Let me move then into the third area, which is the strategic digital infrastructures that we are building. I think some of those have already been mentioned. I would start, of course, by the EURHPC joint undertaking where we're developing the first of a kind, a leading, if you wish, supercomputing infrastructure all over Europe. We are just uh, about uh, to uh, install now not only supercomputers, but also quantum computers next to our supercomputers and provide the possibility to have the first hybrid uh, supercomputing, quantum computing infrastructure that we announced for the next two years. We have also announced that the exascale supercomputer coming to Europe with uh, the one that will be installed hopefully in July in the uh, next 12 months, so Jupiter, and I'm pretty sure that Jupiter, but also the second exascale supercomputer that we hope to acquire uh, somewhere in the next two, three years and to install it in France will also provide huge potential for further research, simulation and advancements in the human brain project and in brain research in general. I would also like to point out here that I think I can say it also that drug, the research for new drugs is highly stimulated by high performance computing and we used one of those possibilities to be able to make drug screening for COVID-19 and I invite you to have a look to the exascale, to the Excalate uh, computing platform that is a unique platform that we have developed in Europe for this kinds of uh, uh, drug screening uh, by using supercomputers. I would also like here to mention the potential of neuromorphic computing. We have developed brain scales in Spinnaker. I think these are very, very well acknowledged and now their uh, path, I would say, to, uh, to the next steps and even to the market is well set. Uh, at the same time, we, um, uh, this has been not only been able to, uh, to run large-scale simulations and deep learning for research, but has also found its way to industrial applications and uh, to the promotion of green digital AI. Other examples that I would like to mention here, which are part of the vision that we are putting in place right now and implementing, is the fact that we are developing a whole set of federated European data infrastructures for creating in the near future very large um, I would say European data spaces, be it for genomics, be it for cancer imaging, but also in many other areas. And here we see also the importance of uh, developing next to those huge data spaces, including, by the way, the European Open Science Cloud data space, the facilities like AI testing and experimentation for health, which would certainly help accelerate the validation of advanced AI and robotic solutions for healthcare. So all these data space and facilities in combination with machine learning and AI, in combination with data analytics, with computing capacities available, will allow the development of advanced methods and tools for research, for diagnosis, and for personalized treatment in several clinical domains. But I think these are things that you understand very, very well, and you have already shown by excellence how this can be done under the Human Brain Project. Fourth, and equally important, if it's more important here, I would like to address here the very, very critical aspect of multi-stakeholder collaboration within and across ecosystems. One of the big successes of HBP is bringing all these different scientific and technological communities together, and we see when excellent people come at the frontiers of the different scientific research and technological development, how they can be so impactful out there and deliver the results we have right now. So this is a very successful example that we would like to continue over the years to come. Now, let me move to the last part of what I would like to say to you today. Next slide, please. About which future for HPP and eBrains. I think Catherine, but also Jan, have already depicted part of that. But let me also make it even more clear. The first direction that we would like to move is definitely this direction of the virtual twins or the digital twins. And our vision here is to build a virtual human uh, twin of the whole body, of the organs, and of everything that is related to the way the human organism is functioning. So we'd like to develop fashion-specific models of the human body to add to diagnostics, treatment, prescribing, or whatever else. So for us, digital twin technology has the potential to completely change the way we develop medicines today. 
So uh, I don't think I need to praise that even more or even to forward uh, the, the whole vision even more. I think you are one of the, uh, the ones that have already developed a, a very good part of that. And I'm pretty sure that from what we hear now, the, you are developing also one of the most complete digital twins uh, uh, of uh, individual brains. And we do believe that all this can be part of this vision of developing the virtual human twins that uh, we are going to announce in the very next few months. Within, uh, with this uh, uh, crucial A uh, in mind, we have already put a coordination support action out there, which is called EDIT, which is just one of the projects that we have launched to be able to develop this further. And with the aim to bring the different scientific communities, but also industrial communities that are in the area, uh, closer together. So the idea, as I said, is uh, to be able to develop further what exactly we need to do in this kind of new vision, in this kind of uh, further developing uh, the kind of an open platform and an ecosystem around these issues that are concerning, of course, the possibility of continuing and developing further and developing for the whole human body, as I said, the notion of multi-scale computational modeling, AI, data analytics, advanced visualization tools, and uh, whatever else one could imagine. And possibly later on, even use it for educational and uh, medical purposes through, uh, I would say, uh, by, by using more and more the notion of augmented and uh, uh, virtual reality. Uh, and I think, as I said, HBP must be part of this work. Now, another major development that we are already having, uh, this has already been anticipated earlier today by Commissioner Gabriel in her message to you. This is about uh, the preparation of the European Brain Health Partnership. This is a response, actually, of the Commission to the member states that demand far more collaboration and coordination for brain health research through a strategic partnership that we would like to put in place uh, starting as of uh, 1st January 2025. I think it's now time for you to also contribute highly into this. I know that you're already contributing from the e-brains infrastructure. I think we should continue our contribution to the development of such partnership uh, and especially value the uh, uh, high level of scientific results you have achieved so far and make sure that these also continue under the partnership that is under development right now. Digital brain research and digital technologies for sharing data and federating service across neuroscience communities that HPV has been pioneering will be a certainly a fundamental part of this, and we want to be there. So as will be the national hubs making up the brain research community across member states that we have fostered. However, to be able to achieve all this, we have in front of us one year and a half, two years to make this work really concrete uh, and, uh, and make it happen. So I think that the HBT Summit comes really at the right moment from this respect to be able to discuss how you can contribute to the, blind, to, to the plant brain health partnership. And more broadly, I'm confident that the wide ranging neuroscience vision paper that uh, uh, Professor Amons mentioned in her speech, would, and, uh, which is gathering now inputs from almost 100 authors um, uh, uh, well beyond actually the HPP would help you in going into this direction of work. I think this paper offers an invaluable framework for the next decade of digital brain research and for the future of the brain's research infrastructure. And it stresses very, very well the importance of engaging with the broad community well beyond HPP. I would like to thank you very, very much for your attention to, uh, to what I said today. And uh, uh, we look forward to a very successful summit, but also to the very successful continuation of HPT in whatever form in the future, and certainly to the e-brains infrastructure, which, as I said today, is a crucial infrastructure for us in the European Union, and not only for us, but for the whole um, neuroscience world and beyond. Thank you very much.